You know, we had so much fun at the Straits Area Antique Auto Show, also known as St. Ignace 96, that we decided to do another show from here. If you were with us last week, you'll remember that this show is held on the streets of St. Ignace, Michigan and attracts over 3,500 cars of all types and makes. Later on, we'll show you some of the more interesting cars on display. And speaking of interesting cars, our classic designers and engineers feature is about a man who designed many unique Studebakers during his career, Robert Burke. If he were here today, he would probably say that his Studebaker's years were some of his most creative years. Uh, they were fun years. When you think of these uh, young designers in their 20s and 30s being able to set the style for an automobile, it had to be exciting. Bob was, uh, you know, just one of these many young designers that was coming out of design schools. Raymond Lowy was hired by Studebaker in 1937 to be their, their premier designer and, and their stylist. He brought in Virgil Exner because Lowy needed to have one of his people in the plant. And in conjunction, Virgil Exner hired one of the most talented designers ever to come down the platform was Bob Burke. And Bob and, and, uh, and Raymond Lowy were both in some ways responsible for that post-war 47 Studebaker. They both did different parts of that, but they, were, they both worked on that car. You know, when you think of this young man coming in, and this was really a vote of approval for his abilities that we would see uh, for many, many years to come. After the war, your 47 uh, was really the car of the future. And if you compare photographs, 47 Studebakers with other car makers, I mean, it was looked like this car fell from, from the sky. That was, to me, one of the most influential cars of the, of the post-war. Every square inch of that car was new. Every bit of the car was fresh and new. I talked my dad into buying one. But the, epit the hallmark of all the cars done in the 50s era was a car that Studebaker did in 1953. To me, in an era of of wretched excess came this beautiful jewel, this clean, beautiful, somewhat European-styled car, and it just caught us all. There wasn't a designer that didn't think that was the biggest knockout in the, in the whole world. And it was Bob Bork that did that. He became, to the rest of us designers, one hell of a significant guy. The chief design feature of all Bob Bork's des designs is the line. There's, there's a line of styling, a scale that is very comfortable, it's very pleasing to look at. He tended to keep his designs very simple. There's not a lot of access chrome. The Studebaker itself, could, you, could, you could drive it in underneath the, or into the, the package of the typical American car. It was so low and so sleek and so, uh, so understated. I think the interesting element about Bob Bork's design is they were always modern, and yet there was also a great deal of class. His designs speak of who he was. Welcome back to My Classic Car. We go all over the country visiting car shows and events like the Straits Area Antique Auto Show here in St. Ignace. And if you'd like us to visit your show, then send us the info on it today. Who knows? You might find yourself on TV like these car nuts. What's the origin of the event? In 1976, we paid every car owner $5 to come here. The next year, they started paying a fee. We never have had a down year. It's always a slight increase or a major increase, then it levels out. And it's, so it, the right time of the year, I think the right location, uh, it's not a judge show, it's a people's choice, so there's no politics involved, but you eat up a lot of shows. Overall, I think we provide celebrities. We have Ed Big Daddy Ross over here behind us. Can you see what Chevrolet brought? Mopar and Ford, they're not, uh, they know what's going on up here. That's their customer, the guy that buys the, the Camaro and the hot Mopar, and maybe even a Prowler. Well, hey Jim, this is pretty unique. You don't see many Hudson pickups. No, you don't, do you? Uh, how'd you come by it? Oh, I bought two of them at auction for $17.50. $17.50? Yes, and I've been looking one for years because they're unique. What year is it? 47. They didn't make many of these, did they? Uh, 3,800, I think. 
And did you do the restoration yourself? I done everything on it. Is there a lot of work to be done? Oh, mercy, yes. This is a 59. And it is, you know, the last year they made them. They made them for three years, 57, 58, and 59. And this is the last year that they built the retractables. Can you show me how it works? Right. I'd be glad to. Everything operates electrically all on one switch. And uh, it was designed with the intention that you did not have to get out of the automobile to do everything with the car. Mr. Ford, Henry Ford II, by the way, that was his dream that when you had this car working, it had to function properly or he would not sell it. That is really something. All there's to it. Thanks Thank a you. lot for showing Thank us you. this, Joe. All righty, let's see you. Thank you much. The number and variety of cars here at St. Ignace sure keeps your pulse rate up. You can expect to see almost anything. One car we haven't seen, though, is a Tucker. But then again, Tuckers are extremely rare. Only 51 were built, and they were 1948 models. We tracked down the owner of one of these elusive automobiles to take an up-close look at a car that's surrounded by as much fiction as fact. In doing the show, we get around a lot of rare cars, but there aren't many more rare than this 48 Tucker. I'm here with its proud owner, Mark Lieberman. Mark, thanks for having us here. I'm very pleased to be here. It's a beauty. Tell me about the Tucker. Be happy to. The 1948 Tucker was a unique automobile. Preston Tucker's concept of bringing this car to the marketplace to a hungry uh, American public that was looking forward to new designs and innovation in automotive styling. Uh, probably the single most best known feature of this automobile is its center headlight. This unusual feature actually turned with the steering of the automobile. It lit your way ahead of you as you went into, into turns. That was novel. Another unique feature of this automobile was the high cut doors. These doors actually cut into the roof line of the automobile, uh, enabling easy access and uh, exit from this vehicle. You see this on automobiles of today. Now these things had a lot of interesting safety features, I guess, ahead of their time, even in the interior, in, in the passenger compartment. Very much so. Preston Tucker was very focused on safety within his vehicles. And as a result of that, he incorporated numerous features along those lines. Where's the dash? <laughs> That's one of them. <laughs> the large open space there was considered the safety crash compartment. The concept behind that is that the passengers would dive into that area in a pending crash and hopefully seek refuge from injury. <laughs> I love it. Another unusual feature along those lines, you'll notice, is the padded dashboard around the automobile. This goes along the car itself, behind the windshield, as well as completely around the passenger compartment on each of the doors. Very rare at that time. The first implementation of this type of padding for safety. A very concentrated instrument cluster too. Efficiency. His concept was to tie all the instruments together into a simple easy to read dial giving you all the necessary information and feedback required to drive the automobile. All in one place. Absolutely. And your shifter there. Well that's part of the uh, concept of design innovation that they wanted to utilize. Preston uh, liked the concept of the cord transmission and incorporated the pre-selector type mechanism into this automobile. So your selection was right here, one, two, three, four in reverse, and you selected it, then put the clutch in. That's correct. It allowed you to choose a gear before actually going into it, and then the car would do it, the rest of it for you. It's amazing. I like the slot machine effect here. What are, what are these levers for? What are they control? Well, you put a quarter in and pull down. <laughs> no, I'm not actually. Each of those levers control a different function, such as headlights, parking lights, the heater, which is cleverly recessed beneath the seat, uh, as well as the controls for the center headlight. But they're not, none of them are marked. Well, this being car number six, and also the first automobile sold to the public, there were certain details that were still yet to be sorted out on these still vehicles. Still working on it, huh? Such as labeling any of the controls. Now, being a rear engine car, she's got a trunk in front. Can we have a look? Absolutely. In fact, there's another interesting story about this trunk. They fitted it with luggage, and the luggage was one of the unique items that you were able to purchase, actually encouraged to purchase, when you ordered a Tucker automobile. You were able to buy a set of luggage, a radio, and a set of seat covers. And these three items were supposed to excite you while you were waiting for your automobile to arrive. So you got those first and had to wait for the car. <laughs> and there are a lot of people with luggage, seat covers, and radios waiting for their car to arrive. Waiting anxiously. Beautiful. 
a very unusual engine configuration for the time. Not only was it a rear engine, but it was a flat six-cylinder aluminum engine that was designed for, of all things, a Bell helicopter. It's actually a, a Franklin Air Cool, right? That's correct. Uh, the name applying air cooled for this particular engine doesn't really apply because for this application they had to retrofit these engines with cooling jackets. But it didn't impair the performance or power of this vehicle at all. As a matter of fact, uh, this particular engine produces 170 horsepower and 390 whopping pounds of torque to really accelerate this 4,200 pound vehicle down the road briskly. Wow. So it's a uh, water cooled, air cooled. That's correct. <laughs> That's nice. And being rear engine and, and, and rear cooled, you've actually got a grill back here. That's correct. What, they, what they've utilized that for is it allows the heat to escape. The fan is actually installed in reverse of what you're typically mm -hmm. used to. So it blows the hot air out through the grill rather than sucking it in. It's one of the designs that were very, very important to Preston and uh, subsequently Alex Tremulus, the designer of this vehicle, was the idea that this vehicle should look like it's going 90 miles an hour while it's sitting in a parking lot. Well, and it does. It does. Say, speaking of going 90 miles an hour, do you suppose we could take this out for a Sunday cruise? Oh, you bet. That's the best part. I love these suicide doors. I'll tell you, the and innovations... they open so beautifully. Absolutely. All this room. Do you have enough space on I your side? I think I do. You know, knee room has always been a problem, but this time we've got it. Well, let's go. Contact. Have you ever been uh, at a Tucker gathering, a Tucker's on parade uh, Absolutely. Event? Well, there is a uh, Tucker Automobile Club yes. that is quite active. They not only have uh, uh, standard meets once a year for their main gatherings, but they have mini meets also a couple of times a year. And they bring uh, automobiles and enthusiasts together to take a look at the memorabilia, to recall the history of the automobile, uh, to uh, recant some of the uh, entrepreneurial work done by Preston Tucker. It only takes a few minutes in a Tucker to realize how advanced the design of this car really was. The air-cooled motors power plant produces a great deal of torque. The rear engine design provides a very quiet passenger compartment and there are unique safety features everywhere. It would take the big three another 10 or 15 years to produce a car as advanced as the Tucker. It makes me wonder, if the big boys really did conspire to put Preston Tucker out of business before he ever began.